I wasn't sure where else to tell anyone about this, but it's killing me if I try to keep it in any longer. You all know me as Tabitha from my investigation of a monster living in the southern part of Illinois, the one that cost me my fiancé's life. Well, I'm back to tell of another strange encounter that happened a month later, how I met that strange trio again, and now I'm entering a whole new reality that our society tries to suppress from the public. I'm done to the opening of this report. Here is my story. I received a call from a small town located a few miles north of Springfield. To prevent any potential troublemakers from knowing where it is, I'll call it Greyfield. Greyfield, Illinois. There wasn't too much information that was going on, but a local tip came in that told us that there was a dire need for both Chicago and Springfield PIs, such as myself. I wasn't too sure about what I was getting myself into, but the only information that I was able to receive from this tip was that there was a man that had recently been delivered to the police station after he was found in the woods covered in blood. The chief in the area was keeping it on the down low and didn't want the FBI to come to investigate and commandeer the whole case. Believe it or not, there's a little animosity between law enforcement and their FBI counterparts, which I can completely understand. The FBI had the tendency to be professional, and in the cases of strange encounters, the police tended to hate their meddling in local affairs. I am not so by the books. Back when I dealt with that bizarre case that I may have gone rogue on, not to mention those three mysterious people that I ran into, I thought that maybe this would be a good way to distance myself, since the typical crime in Springfield are robberies and homicide cases that are typically between two people. When I arrived at the town, I was greeted by one of the police officers who led me into the station. He had this nervous tick, like something was itching on his neck. Are you okay? I asked. Yeah, he jittered. It's just that ever since we brought this guy in, there's been a change in the atmosphere. How so? I don't know. Feeling a dread? Like something horrible is lingering in the air? When we went inside, I instantly knew what he was talking about. There were people, both cops and regular civilians in here, that didn't look like they had much going on inside their heads other than a perpetual state of fear across their faces. I saw another one of the private investigators who was standing in the corner. His face was towards the wall. When I took a closer look, I saw that he was mumbling with his lips. He was talking to the wall. Why wasn't state law enforcement notified? I asked the cop. He was still scratching his neck, twitching, and barely paying attention to anything I said. Hey, I'm asking you. I shouted to pull his attention back to me. I heard you. I don't really know. The higher-ups here were adamant that they weren't going to have any other private investigators helping with this case. The chief still believes it to be something the local PD can handle. Well, I wasn't too sure. If this is how everyone's reacting to whatever's wrong with this man, perhaps there is a need for superior law enforcement to get involved. When we got to the interrogation room that they seemingly had locked the man in, I was greeted by the chief of police. He had a bald head and a thick gray mustache. I feel like this is the default look for all chiefs. Oh, it's good that you're doing okay, miss. Detective is fine. Well, detective, what do you think about all this? I already had some other private eyes take a swing at the guy, but they keep having emotional trauma from the encounter. I also ordered no police officers to interact with the man. Why is he in the interrogation room? Can't leave him in the jail cells. This isn't a prison, you know. Can't leave him in a room with other people. Everyone keeps having the heebie-jeebies whenever he gets too close to him. And don't even get me started whenever he talks. When I took a look at the man, he looked unremarkable. In fact, I'd say he was quite a handsome man, but he was still covered in blood. His hands looked like they could wrap fully around my neck, and may have at some point. I don't know why my mind went there, but everything that he reminded me of was that he had malicious intent. Another thing that I wanted to note was that he was staring with his head turned towards us. His eyes did not move once. I've heard of people having an incredible focus, but never eyes that were so dead fixed in one position. They never flinched once, 
And that was the part that was starting to get to me. I could feel my heart rate increasing rapidly, and the direction that he was staring in was also unnerving. He was looking straight ahead, at me, despite this being a one-way window. It felt like he knew I was in here. Anyway, if you want to give him a go, you're free to interrogate. I was having second thoughts, but I already drove all the way up here. It'd be rude as to back out now. I went into the room and saw that his eyes were already looking at me. He knew I was here the whole time. He was waiting for my entry. So, I'm told that you were found in the woods. He gave me a grim smile. I was a little nervous, wondering if he was going to talk. What the chief said about him talking had gotten me on edge. I knew this was an interrogation, and talking was natural. But at the same time, I didn't want to be staring at a wall like a delusional mess. Well, if you don't feel like talking, how about you write something down on this? I pulled out a piece of paper and a pencil. If he even tried to use the pencil as a weapon, I'm pretty sure my 9mm would prove to be enough to kill him. I'm not afraid to put a bullet in a killer. He looked at the paper, and again his eyes stared blankly. I was wondering if maybe he was crazy, but somehow he had an unusual ability to make everyone else become unhinged. Not going to write anything? I asked. Again, interrogation requires talking, and I was still having an internal disagreement with continuing on. He looked back up at me with those blank, black eyes. We locked, and I kept peering further into his eyes, and thought I saw something inside the pupils. A small spark of yellow light. Uh, you know, if you don't want to, I can just leave you to think about when you want to fess up. As I turned around and tried to reach for the door handle, I was having another internal monologue in my head. I was disappointed in myself. Usually I'm good at getting hard to crack suspects into confessing, or at the very least trying to explain their alibis. But this man had gotten me unnerved by his presence alone. I was sloppy, and moved too quickly with this. Are you wanting your fiancé back? I stopped in my tracks and felt my heart freeze up in my chest. It was like solid ice was in my blood. What? Did you... Oh, he did not like that. Or perhaps would you rather join him in his grave? I marched over to him, stomping my feet down with increasing frustration about his words. Listen here, don't you ever talk... Wait, how do you know about my fiancé? Another wide, cruel smile formed on his face as he had this bemused expression. I know all your nightmares. I see your worst fears, and I know that you're still reeling from the laws. The way he said those words was enough to make me want to reach for my gun. I wasn't looking for a peaceful resolution now, but I had to maintain self-control. I couldn't let him get under my skin. But he started wiping some of the blood off of the tips of his fingers and looked at me again, saying, Or perhaps you're afraid. Being looked down on by older, more experienced men and women. To be written off as a rookie that no one needs to take seriously. I was gritting my teeth and clenching my fingers tight. I don't know how, but he seems to know every insecurity that either I am completely aware of or have been repressing. But what happens next was the final straw. I said, I'm leaving. But he replied, Good, because I'm certain that your friend Chloe is quite used to you leaving. Everything froze, and I immediately turned around. My anger had reached a boiling point, and my body was shaking. I found myself instinctively reaching for my gun, ready to put a bullet in this psycho. But as I was just about ready to pull it out, the intercom came on. Detective, that's enough. Come back inside. I took one last look at him, angered by his mischievous little smile. How dare he bring up Chloe? All that other stuff wasn't my fault, but I can never forgive myself for what I did all those years back. 
That was my fault. I was in the office of the police chief. He looked angry at me, but I could tell that he wasn't going to say anything about me nearly killing that guy. He put down the iPad and said, Well, that's the six detectives so far. Looks like we're going to have to call in a specialist in bizarre cases. I'm sorry. He somehow managed to get to me with every insecurity and bad memory. The chief exhaled audibly. Listen, detective. This guy gets to everyone. Every police officer and detective who has gone towards him has had all their fears, insecurities, and painful memories used against him by that guy. Really? Yeah. Honestly, I'd say you're the one taking the best. Some of the officers have gone home and hadn't been returning my calls. Few of the other PIs that we called in have also withdrawn and gone home. Some about them being so startled by that man from what he knew about him that I heard one of them is deciding to quit. So, that man knows how to bring up everyone's worst fears. Then he uses them against you. But it's not like he said very much to me. Yet, whatever it was, maybe the tone of his voice, the way he smiled, the way that he's a complete stranger who knows about everything, that's probably why I became so unnerved and wanted to kill him. The chief told me that I could go home, but I was still in a state of shock. I wasn't about to let this case slip by me. I was staying at an apartment building, still trying to piece together everything as well as repress the old memories that I had long ago locked away. It's been so long now that I nearly forgot everything about what happened that day. I almost was able to move on from such a bad memory. Maybe if I explain more, I'll feel a little better about this. Chloe was my friend when we were teenagers. We used to go exploring out in the woods, and there was a rumor that there was someone out there that would kidnap children. We were young, and thought that since we were teenagers, that wouldn't apply to us. Well, one day, Chloe, a bright, blonde, and somewhat boy-crazy girl at the time, spent her day trying to pick flowers for some popular kid in school. I refrained from doing such childish things. I wanted to be perceived more as an adult and wait for a boy to bring me flowers. But I didn't criticize her for what she did. We had different methods of how we were going to get the guy. I turned my back to her for about three minutes to use the bathroom, something that is difficult for a girl in the woods, but when I came back, I couldn't find her anywhere. I went about searching as far as I could, but no matter where I looked, I couldn't see her anywhere. I called out her name repeatedly. Everything was starting to get surreal, and I was believing that she was genuinely gone. I would have been more inclined to believe that she was hiding, but we made a promise not to do that in these woods and I didn't believe that she would abandon me. We both knew about the legend. The legend of the kidnapper. I kept looking around, searching far and wide, until I came across a small ravine that cut through. I saw, on the other side, a mysterious, hooded creature with a dozen solid black eyes. Like bug eyes. They were staring back at me, and the skin appeared to resemble the texture of a wasp nest. It stood like a human, slightly slouched over, and it had two long arms and fingers that resembled more like hooks. My eyes drifted down toward what was in its other hand furthest away from me, and I saw her. I saw Chloe. Her eyes looked lifeless, tears streaming down them, but her face looked like it had seen something that was enough to make her fall unconscious. She was also missing her legs. They had been torn off. I walked away for only three minutes. She never screamed, never made a peep. But she was there. The lifeless young girl who had so much to look forward to. The creature's mouth stretched open, revealing fangs that were unusually lengthened like a tiger's. It let out a grisly bear-sounding call and looked like it was about to start marching towards me. Without a second thought, I turned tail and ran. I never stopped. I ran all the way home after everything that I had seen. I left my best friend behind. 
I went home and hid in my room. I stayed under my bed for a few hours, crying and thinking about what I had done. I only left her for three minutes. Only three. How did everything get so bad in such a short amount of time? I think what made it worse afterward was that I never reported it. I kept it all to myself, and when her parents went looking for her, I pretended that I didn't know. I didn't want to get in trouble because now the police were involved. It just wasn't fair. Too afraid to tell them the truth, but having to hold on to so much emotional baggage when you're only 14. As I sit in my motel room right now, I think about what I could have done that day. Maybe if I held it in, she would still be here. She could have asked out that boy, but instead, her life was cut short because I only thought about what I needed at the moment. We both knew those words were dangerous, but I think we were too confident. And since he brought that up, now all I want is to put that man behind bars forever. I won't let him get away with bringing this up. I will never forgive him for what he said about my fiancé or Chloe. The next morning, I arrived back at the police station. I was going to get him to talk, and I wasn't going to listen to him bring up any more of my issues. But as I walked up to the building, I noticed a familiar-looking vehicle that was parked nearby. Hold on. That couldn't be. Now I was running as fast as I could into the building. Going through those doors, I was greeted by the same group of distraught people that were wandering about the building. And that's when I spotted him. Standing at the corner, I saw him talking to the lady. It was Henry. His beard had grown more, and he was dressed differently. He had a long brown trench coat with a large collar, a brown fuzzy ivy cap on his head, and gloves with the fingers cut off. His brunette hair was wavy, but still groomed enough to make him look like a man not to mess around with. But still... Those eyes had a sharpness that could send a chill down anyone's spine. The lady at the counter said, All right, everything is in order. You may proceed to see the chief, Mr. Miller. Thank you. He spoke softly and walked away. I followed after, quickly showing everyone who tried to stop me from continuing my badge. I wasn't about to let him escape me once again. I had questions, and I needed to know what the deal was. He moved through the crowd with a distinct phantom-like grace. It was like everyone was ignoring his existence and paying me all the attention. I had to constantly tell an officer who would cut me off that I'm a detective and I was here to see the special suspect. How could they forget me so quickly? I was here yesterday. By the time I reached the end of a hallway, he was gone. I knew where he was going, to see the suspect. And in all likelihood, he was still in the interrogation room. My first stop would be there. When I opened the door, I saw that the chief was staring out the glass, listening to a conversation take place on the other side. He did not look happy. I approached the chief from the side and said, Where is he? He's talking to the suspect. But then he took closer notice of my presence. Wait, I thought I sent you home. I'm ready to give it another go with the guy. The chief chuckled a little but I nudged his shoulder, realizing what he thought. You know what I mean. I know that you're taking this rather personally. Why don't you just watch and see what the specialist has to say about this? The way he said specialist told me that he had a certain amount of contempt for Henry. I don't think it was personally aimed at him, but I think the police chief doesn't like how there is a specialist here who can basically boss around everyone. We both watched Henry as he sat on the opposite end of the glass. He didn't say anything, but started using hand gestures. I believe he was using sign language. Unfortunately, I never practiced sign language, so everything was lost on me. To my surprise, the suspect began speaking back with similar sign language hand movements. They were having a conversation, and I could tell that the chief was getting a little irritated. The suspect would never smile. He smiled when I was in the room, but he had a serious stare when dealing with Henry. Henry said, So you're one of them? 
The suspect replied calmly. Of course, but I can see that protection hiding in your nervous system. I deal with your race all the time. Being around your kind has made me immune to your influence. That, and my boss doesn't want to lose a good worker. Smart. I would have never guessed a human could have survived an interaction with a primordial. Typically, we just wear your kind as a skin suit. I had heard all this before. Henry was only here because the suspect was not an ordinary man. Judging by how his presence had had an effect on everyone around him, he was some sort of man made of nightmares. A walking terror that could break even the strongest of wills. But Henry seemed immune to the effect. Now tell me, where are your victims? Said Henry suddenly. I moved closer, pressing my nose against the glass. The suspect cackled abruptly. I'm surprised you know there were victims. Are you a telepathic human? Henry leaned in. No, but I know that there's been a string of disappearances in remote off-the-grid homes in the area around here. How could you have possibly found out about that? He looked smugly at the suspect and glowed at. Radio. These isolated people are notorious for using them and informing each other. You just have to have a connection, too, like my daughter does. I was infuriated. He was stealing my case so effortlessly. I couldn't believe it. But everyone stood still and got unexpectedly cold and quiet when the mysterious man slowly stood up. Henry backed up in response to this change of events. The suspect announced. Well, well, well. I guess I have to congratulate you on knowing just enough to be a real pain. I thought I could have more fun years spreading. But you just painted a bigger target on my back. So I'm afraid it's time I leave. But I shall honor you with my name. It's Knox. And I will be leaving now. Henry looked like he was going to protest, but Knox's eyes flashed a different color, burning a bright yellow. But then a black slime leaked out in a horrifying display that made me think I was in a horror movie. It was so surreal, and I didn't want to believe it was real life. Glad I'm not... I stopped myself when I turned around and saw that the police chief was also pointing his face up and at the same black slime leaking out of every orifice in his head. I checked my face, out of fear that I was going to change with him, but everything appeared to be fine. I turned back towards Henry, and he was already rushing for the door. Right as it was opening, I blocked him, and he jumped back a little upon seeing my face again. Whoa, wait a minute. Have we met before? I looked at him in astonishment. He really couldn't remember me. I thought for sure he would remember me after the monster attack that was no more than a few weeks ago. Regardless, I grabbed hold of him by the hand and we both escaped from the room. When we got out into the hallway, there were a few people in the crowd who were also having that black slime leaking out from their faces. There was so much panic going on, and people were screaming and rushing all in the same direction. Some were too terrified to move because they didn't want to get close to those who were infected. I looked down both ends of the hallway and saw that there was no way out. We moved a little further toward the back end, but then the wall behind us blew out from behind us. Both Henry and I fell to the ground, and we were partially buried by rubble. All I could hear was screaming in my ears. Their terrified, frantic panic was about to start a panic attack in me. Memories of everything that I had gone through were now flashing before my eyes. I cried out under my breath, hoping that I could suppress the memories for a little bit longer, at least until the terror in the room had stopped. But I felt someone's hand wrap around mine. I was lifted up, suddenly, and almost fell onto Henry's chest. Hey, you still with me? He said as he grabbed my shoulders and gave me a gentle shake. I... I mumbled and groaned, trying to collect my thoughts, and snapped myself out of my confusion. My breathing had not subsided just yet. Walking was difficult, and I kept losing my breath. I needed Henry to stop and give me a minute, but he was forceful in keeping me moving. He grabbed my hands tightly and turned in the other direction, a direction of an empty hallway with dead bodies everywhere. It was an awful scene, 
but I noticed that there was no one with the black goo on them that was on the ground. We escaped to the outside, instantly hit by a blast of crisp air and wind. Outside, it had been snowing, and we saw footprints of at least a dozen people who had walked out into the blizzard. The town was quiet. Everything felt still and lifeless. What is he? I asked. Henry had this visible look of disappointment on his face. Nothing good. It's a primordial, but there's something different about it. I'd never seen one that had a human body. The two of us stood in the middle of the road, staring out into the distance to see if we could identify a single person that was at the farthest end, but the blizzard had provided the perfect cover for our suspect and his thralls. I refused to leave Henry's side. I followed him all the way back to the motel that looked like utter garbage. It was definitely a place that he would stay in once and probably never again. He opens the door and gestured for me to come in with him. There were two queen-sized beds inside, and sitting on the bed at the far end was that girl and monster again. If I remember correctly, it's Samantha and Cusham. Henry said, Well, bad news. It's a primordial, and he can control a whole human body. Cusham sat up more attentively, but Samantha was too invested in the TV show to even notice that I was in the room. That's nothing to worry about. I told you, my species can take control of any other organic or inorganic matter, as long as whatever it is is capable of movement and isn't more powerful than us. Yeah, but somehow he's able to take control of other people. I wasn't sure the whole number, but a decent number of people at the police station suddenly had some black goo escaping from their faces. The elk monster pondered and scratched his head. Hmm. Could be a carrier variant. Able to spread an influence on other creatures nearby and use them like puppets. All I'm going to tell you is, don't feel inclined to save them. They're already dead. Henry nodded and got down to the floor to reach under the bed closest. He pulled out a shotgun. A Beretta 1301 tactical shotgun. How did you get that? I assume you have a permit. He raised his eyebrow at me. Permit? No, I have to get everything off of the black market. Also, I thought they were called gun licenses. What? No, this isn't Europe. Are you a city boy by any chance? Henry turned red with embarrassment, but it was made worse when Cushum said matter-of-factly. Yeah. Shut it, bonehead. Cushum and Sam laughed at their uneducated friend on how gun laws worked in the U.S., I wasn't going to fight him on this, mostly because he's using them responsibly and just to get those primordial beasts. But there was so much going on, and now that I was back in the fold of these people, I wanted to help them. I'm good with guns, too, and I didn't want to go through a repeat of what happened in my childhood. I didn't want to feel helpless. We went back to the car and started driving around, noticing that there were a number of houses with their doors open. It was apparent that the thralls were raiding the homes of the people living here. We stopped at a red light, mostly to get a look at the surrounding area. Henry looked worn out and said, I could really use a drink right now. Is drinking really important to you right now? Only the drinks that make me numb, he said crossly. I was surprised by his tone and quieted up. A moment of silence made the air in the car tense. And he replied softly. I'm sorry. It's been a rough few years. That bad that you drink a lot? He coughed a little. Yeah, that bad. I'm sure your daughter doesn't like it. I tried to use that tactic. He looked up at the red light that shone across his aged face. I swear he looked to be in his late thirties, possibly forties even. Henry, was all I could say before the glowing hum of a car got louder and louder, before whiplashing us back and then forward, thrashing me around, and my ears were in jolting pain from the loud, abrasive tearing of metal. I was knocked out by the impact alone. 
My heavy, aching head was the first thing I felt when I regained consciousness. I looked up and saw that both my arms were spread out and chained in opposite directions in a cold, damp, concrete room. Judging by the architecture, I'd say an abandoned factory. But I think the worst part that I noticed was when I felt a breeze across my chest area. Much to my shock, my shirt had been removed, and there was no way I could use my arms to cover up. I looked ahead and saw that Henry was on the other side of the room, also shirtless. My face grew warm when I saw that he had some muscles and thick chest hair, but I immediately had to shake off my attraction because now is not the time. A metal door creaked open with a loud groaning. Out stepped our suspect. He saw that I was awake and smiled grimly. Oh, good. His snake-like voice echoed in the room. You're awake. Sorry to take off your shirts, but torturing you is a lot easier when it's off. He walked over towards Henry and slapped him on the back of the head. This immediately jolted him awake. Hey, where am I? I was still embarrassed, and unfortunately for me, he did notice me from across the way. His eyes widened and his gaze shifted to the floor. But he muttered, Oh, you work out? Shut up! I snapped at him. My captor cleared his throat. If you two are done, I hate to break it to you that this is the part where I start tormenting you for my own amusement. Henry had this smug expression on his face and looked up at him. Or what? You're gonna beat me up? The suspect chuckled and turned back towards me, saying, Don't you worry. I'm well aware of what will happen if I inflict any damage on you. You'll have your little Deathwalker class know of your location due to the connection between you two. He stopped beside me and continued. But she doesn't. He turned and punched me as hard as he could right into my face. I felt something break in my jaw. Whoa, don't you- Henry pushed forward angrily. But three of his thralls emerged from the darkness and held Henry in place, making him unable to move anymore. Or what? He taunted. I felt what it was that broke, and it was a tooth, just as I feared. I spat it out with a bloody color to it, preparing myself for way worse. Coming in from the door was one of the puppets that was being controlled by this monster. It lifted its hand showing a metal rod with a number glowing red hot. Do you know how many people I've tortured? Henry was trying his best to pull on the chain, but it was to no avail. Fifty-nine. I have tortured that many. She shall be sixty. He walked behind me, and I prepared myself for the inevitable sting of the burn. I didn't think today would be the day I'd be branded. Already, I could feel the slight warmth of the heated metal, knowing full well that the number on it was sixty. My fist gripped tighter as I felt the sudden, sharp burn dig straight into my back on my left shoulder. I kept screaming. I was not prepared for this kind of pain. I wanted it to stop, but he only kept laughing as he pushed a little harder into my skin. At first, it was so hot, it was a burning, cold feeling, but not much longer than a second, it was true, searing pain. For what felt like an eternity of stinging agony, he finally pulled it away, tearing a little skin off. I felt my skin melting on my back, and I had nothing to bite on, nothing to grab hold of to try and deal with the pain. All I had was the look on Henry's face that was full of guilt but I never blamed him for this. I wanted to come along, so I guess that one is on me. My head hung low. He, it, whatever that thing is, he did not stop with searing my skin. The other things he did were just as horrible. After he was done burning my flesh, he reached towards my mouth and forced it open with unusual strength. I was afraid he was going to break my jaw, but instead, he pinched two of my bottom front teeth. 
and crushed them with ease. Never once could I even come close to describing the unimaginable pain and agony that put me through. But then he did something I was not expecting at all. Sure, I was expecting anything from physical pain to sexual degradation. Thankfully, that never happened. But he instead placed his hands on my head and forced me back into the woods where my friend was killed. He made me relive that moment over and over and over. I was forced to endure the pain of my lover's death as well. The day my father had a heart attack and I had to help my sick mom. All the bad memories and on repeat for what felt like days, but were merely hours. Thankfully though, he got interrupted when one of his puppets came into the room to tell him that some police officers were investigating nearby. Well then, we should probably go eat them, don't you think? He released his grip. He and the thralls left the room, leaving Henry to stare at me with guilt. I looked up at him, my mind worn out from repeated trauma, and my face was burning. The inside of my mouth was a bloody mess, and my back was excruciatingly sore. I'm sorry. Don't be. I mumbled painfully. He called for my attention again. No, you should. He knows that Cushion will only come here if I'm in physical pain. I should have asked Cushion to add you into the connection with him too. My eyes were hanging low that I could barely see. I tried my best to smile. I don't blame you. Neither of us could have seen this coming. He said. I'm also sorry that I can't reach my lock pin. There was a long silence between us. I couldn't help but let a tear slip. My mind was racing and I felt shame. Shame from being exposed. Shame for not being strong enough or smart enough. I broke down and felt useless. I couldn't bear to look at Henry. I barely knew him, but right now, he was all I had to be here with me. I had to accept that when that monster comes back, I'm going to die. Well, that's that, then, I said, defeatedly. Not necessarily, although those thralls weren't going to let me earlier, but our captor wasn't paying enough attention. My eyes perked up, and I wondered what he meant by that. But before I could even formulate what he was implying, he started pulling hard on the chain with his right arm. I didn't think he was going to break the chains, but I quickly realized what he was trying to do. He yanked as hard as he could, and he started screaming, too, gritting his teeth as he kept pulling with all of his strength. Finally, I heard a slight crack in his wrists, and he let out a sudden, guttural shout. He finished his motion, trying his best to catch his breath after all that. That should give him the message. Both of us waited with bated breaths, eagerly waiting for help to arrive. I'd say no more than six excruciatingly long minutes passed, and we heard thrashing downstairs, traveling all the way up to the second floor, the sound of a sword being swung around violently, and the bludgeoning sounds of flesh being torn to shreds. The door was violently kicked open, and standing in front of us was a six and a half foot tall animal corpse, draped in leather and black colored metallic armor. In his left hand was the chief, his body twitching and a gaping, bloody hole in his torso. That was fast? Henry looked surprised. You're only down the street from the motel. He approached Henry and snapped the chains so easily. His strength must have been enormous. Then he turns to me before looking back at Henry, who is still caressing his broken wrist. Do I have to save this one too? He sounded like he was hoping Henry would say no. Yeah, he barked at the monster. He grumbled under his breath and walked towards me to break my chains as well. Now that we were both free, I quickly scanned the room to find a shirt. I had already been defiled enough today. Henry insisted that I be healed first, and Cushion complied, laying his hand on all the injuries I received, and even he eased a little of the trauma that I was just inflicted with. Sadly, my teeth were not restored, 
and I felt the bump of scar tissue of where I had been burned. Then, he healed Henry, and placed his hand on his broken wrist. I wasn't sure what was happening, but Henry spoke up. Ah, that feels much better. Kusham replied. Broken bones take longer for my healing touch. Her teeth will probably grow back in an hour, but your wrist is going to take much longer. In that case, give her my gun. He pointed his eyes at me. Kusham looked at me again, and despite his inability to emote, I could almost tell he was frustrated by my presence. Then again, he seems like the type who doesn't like people in general, and isn't helping these two out of any altruism. He found Henry's shirt, jacket, and shotgun, turned back towards me, and held it out, saying, She better be useful. I'm going to need her to provide support. Frankly speaking, I was offended by his demanding words. This reminded me of all the ill will I had gained from numerous people who had looked down on me. Maybe because I'm a woman, maybe because I'm African American, or maybe they just thought they were better entirely. Whatever it was, I wasn't about to take it any longer, especially from something that isn't even my own species. I'm exceptionally good with a gun, bonehead. I snapped. Henry's face went pale, and I immediately choked on my own words. Cushum growled. Don't fail me then, human maggot. I grabbed hold of the firearm and took a deep breath, so thankful that I didn't just get my face torn completely off from my head. Cushum led the way forward, and when we exited the warehouse, it was snowing even heavier than before. And what was worse was that there was a crowd of about thirty more of those puppets that surrounded us. Standing in the back was their puppeteer, leering at the three of us with a stoic expression. Cushum said, Aim for the chest or head. They won't stop until you destroy either the heart or the brain. My hands were shaking as I gripped harder on the handle of the gun. I was not as mentally prepared as I had hoped, but I had to stay focused and do this for all the people that this monster had killed. Henry placed his hand on my arm and said, I know we barely know each other, but I have a good feeling that you know what you're doing. Those words of encouragement were what I needed. I took in a deep, cold, air-filled breath, and with an elk-sounding shriek from Cushum, the two of us charged forward, and I started shooting at any thrall that got too close to me. One down, two down, three, four, five. They were relatively easy to deal with when you have a shotgun, but I was starting to feel overwhelmed when six of them all at once tried to gang up on me. Kushim came out from the right and rammed his sword through all of them, slicing them all in half in a gruesome display. I almost wanted to throw up but such unsightly handling by his dealing with the enemy, but I guess it can't be helped. The puppeteer pointed his finger at us, and I noticed that the skin around his hand was starting to unravel like bandages. It was crawling down his arm. The rest of the thralls ran towards us at full speed in a desperate attempt to blitz us with overwhelming numbers. I kept firing, scoring shot after shot, and thankful that I always went to the gun range to practice. Cushum wasn't nearly having as much of a hard time, but he did find himself getting tackled a few times. One woman tried to punch through his leather armor, and I took aim and managed to headshot her, leaving a red spray on Cushum. I felt terrible each time I had to do it, but I had to keep it in my head that they were already gone, and their bodies were being used as nothing more than slaves by a creature that had no respect for human life. After fighting for quite a few minutes, we managed to thin out the herd and had to go fight our main target, but he was a whole different beast by the time our fight with him had arrived. The snow had intensified, and he was walking slowly toward us. The entire bottom and left side of his body had completely started to unravel. Black, muscular flesh was underneath, and his eyes were glossy, deadened, and unbroken in their focus on us. I said, What in God's name? The menace had nearly completely transformed into something abominable, inhuman in every sense. It had turned into nothing I could have prepared for. Its skin was thick, 
dark brown and sparkling like it was covered in glitter. It had four absurdly long arms, which were as sickly and emaciated as the rest of the body. Five human skulls were impaled all over its torso, with one being melded to the right side of its head. And speaking of the head, there wasn't an actual face attached. There was only a massive mouth filled with thorn-shaped teeth, and above that was a single gray orb. I could only guess that it was an eye, but the worst part was that it had to be at least 14 feet tall, with eight massive tentacles to fight through. Cusham remarked, This just isn't my day, is it? I began firing at the tentacles as we moved in closer. The snow was getting hard to move around in, but I had to stay on full alert and not let it slow me down for a second. Cusham couldn't get closer. Each time he did, one of the tentacles would sway in his direction and nearly hit him. And when he tried to cut one of them, it merely moved out of the way faster than he could swing. Long story short, it was only up to me at this point. I never stopped my barrage of bullets into the morbid beast. It would attempt to subdue me, but a shotgun blast was way stronger than its thick skull. Unfortunately, this did little to effectively destroy the tentacles, and we were going to need another plan. Looking up, I saw one of the massive tentacles getting ready to slam down and flatten me, forcing me to do a barrel roll and take another shot. I was getting down to my last bullets. Cushram tried to move in and perform a sneak attack, but the creature's skulls were rattling and he got swatted away. The creature was about to come for me next, and I wasn't sure what else I could do. I wouldn't get my chance because one of the tentacles managed to slip from behind me and quickly wrap around my legs and throw me up towards the mouth of the primordial. I looked at those teeth and mentally prepared myself for how absolutely painful this was going to be. Hey! Henry's voice echoed from across the parking lot that we had been fighting in. Our adversary took one look at him before turning his attention back to me. Hey now, you too, stupid. I looked back at him with a confused expression. What was he trying to do? He was slowly walking out with his left hand behind his back. The monster replied, How about you wait your turn? I would, he said as he stood right in front of the creature. But I'm rather enthusiastic to get back into the fight. With that broken wrist, I highly doubt you're much of a threat, it remarked. Henry chuckled a little bit, and his eyes moved to the right. This spooked our adversary to look back and see what it was. Was it Cushion with a sneak attack? But I maintained my eyes on Henry, and he looked at me, holding out a grenade with his other hand. He threw it to me, and I caught it, my heart nearly jumping out of fear of dropping it. When the head turned back towards Henry, he said, Plain tricks. He smiled. Yeah. When the monster looked back at me and stretched its mouth wide open to prepare to swallow me whole, I had already pulled the pin and quickly threw it into its mouth, going right down its open throat. It panicked and quickly dropped me as it tried to reach in and grab the explosive from its throat. I fell onto the soft snow and quickly tried to crawl away. Henry was turning around and jumping into the snow himself. I heard a loud bang go off from behind me and felt liquid splatter all over my back and head. It was so cold now and my hands were already starting to freeze up. The heat of the battle was coming to a close. I turned around and saw that the entire head down to the upper part of the torso had been blown up, but there was a light escaping from the body. It was a bright orange color, and Cushum came running up fast from behind me and jumped on top of the much more massive rival. His maw opened wide, and he started to suck in the orange light, with his blue light flowing around the entire enemy's body. After a couple seconds had passed, there was no more of that orange light, and the blue light retreated back inside Cushum. There was a long silence that followed as we tried to get our bearings together. I don't know where I had dropped the shotgun, which I don't think Henry would be too happy to hear. 
He was still holding on to his injured arm and said to me as I was getting up, You were awesome out there. You too, I said, flattered by his compliment. Kushum came walking up to both of us and said, She's a way better shot than you are. Henry got defensive and said, So what? I'm still practicing. Kushum chuckled and sheathed his sword before bowing his head to me and walking away with heavy clanking. Henry said with a smug look, I think he likes you now. So, I guess this is where I end things. We went our separate ways, but this time Henry was kind enough to give me a phone number and his address of his new home. In fact, he wants to employ me in future jobs should he be in the area at some point. Despite what I went through today, I felt obligated to help. He saved my life twice now, and I wanted to know more about his work. As for the massacre that we had just left in our wake, I thought it best to slip away and act like I had already left before any of the unfortunate murders were reported. I often think about where my life is going now. I used to investigate missing person cases and other small-time criminal acts. Now I find myself being drawn into a much more strange, unreal, and frankly speaking, absurd world that doesn't get talked about in the news or police reports. There's something increasingly getting wrong as the years have been going on, ever since 2020 rolled around. I think we may be entering a period where humanity will have to fight for its very survival. I don't know for certain, but this is based on a hunch. I think there's a war starting. <laughs>